maybe not dumb ideas, uh, but ideas and policies which we have all lived with, with for the last two and a half years, ideas and policies which have had massive impacts on us as individuals and as a society. The government has effectively rolled back its powers to tackle the COVID pandemic emergency virus. Uh, after their latest review, lockdowns, the MIQ system, all worker vaccine mandates, gathering limits, that's you know, social gathering limits, vaccine passes and entry requirements at our borders have all been scrapped. Self-isolation requirements for cases, uh, people who get it, like I did last week, that remains uh, in household contacts, as well as some mask requirements within certain healthcare settings. But largely that huge raft of measures um, are gone. And whilst the emergency powers, the ability to invoke emergency powers for the government remains, I think, until May next year, it doesn't look like the government is going to extend it past that time. So this may be the end of the age of COVID. Um, could the government have done this sooner? Is it giving away powers it needs to cope with a pandemic? And also yesterday, Chris Hipkins hints we may have some sort of review or inquiry into the COVID response over the last and a half years. Joining us to unpick all this, uh, a man who speaks a lot of sense on COVID, a former advisor indeed to the government on its pandemic policy and one of the country's leading health academics from Auckland University, Professor Des Gorman. Des, lovely to have you with us again. How are you doing? I'm well, thanks, Sean, and yourself? Uh, yeah, I, I had finally got the COVID. I, uh, last week I was off or in self-isolation, so I, it's now lived experience for me. Uh, Des, do you think it is the right time or a little late to remove all these measures? I think some of these measures have been somewhat redundant for a long time, Sean. I think uh, when the government gave up its zero COVID policy, a lot of these issues could have gone at, at that time. So I think it's had trouble unravelling the various and intricate uh, positions they put in place because, in fact, as I've said to you before, I think this whole pandemic has been run against political risk. And if you suddenly dismantle everything, then, of course, the obvious observation as well, were those things unnecessary in the first place? So I think they were caught within a rock and a hard place. And so I think they had to dismantle it in a way which looked as though it was coherent and sensible and following advice. But in reality, they're just saying, oh, God, that didn't really work. We'd rather not talk about it. Let's move on. Yeah, I think so. I mean, if you think about the thousands of lives saved, I mean, that great myth that came from that modelling at the get-go about tens of thousands of deaths, very clearly we simply delayed our peak of the epidemic. Uh, very clearly uh, a lot of people have died. And more importantly, Sean, there has been a lot of uh, excess avoidable deaths for other reasons uh, which aren't reported. I mean, what we should be reporting, by the way, is not COVID-related deaths, but what's the total excess mortality? Because we need to know just how many people have died of untreated illnesses like cancer, how many people didn't go to hospital with a heart attack or with whatever or stroke because they were worried about what a sort of infectious cesspit our hospitals were. So, so uh, I think the, these measures, uh, uh, the removal of them is a, is a recognition that, in fact, they have gone past the use by date. All right. Did they work at all, Des? And but I guess that's the question over a review of the whole policy reaction. Did we do the right yeah. thing? Um, well, they certainly delayed the peak. Um, the whole idea was to delay the peak until the health system had the capacity to cope. Well, in fact, that's a bit of a joke because the health system's in a worse state now than it's been in probably in our memories. Uh, and certainly, although doctors and nurses have historically complained about workload, I think their complaints now really bear some, some uh, resonance. I mean, there is, unfortunately, our health system is imploding and so the idea that we'd delay the peak until the health system had the capacity to deal with it is a bit of a misnomer because very clearly 
uh, the peaks occurred at a time where the health system is literally on its knees. Yeah, there's the question then is how else might we have dealt with this? Yeah, uh, look, it's a very good question. At the very get go, when places like Singapore were taking the pandemic seriously, uh, we should have closed our borders then for a few weeks to give us a breathing space because clearly we didn't have a pandemic plan and we were completely unprepared. And that's when I described us as being caught with our pants down. So I think the first thing is that rather than going hard and early, we went late. Uh, some bits of our response were hard. Most of it was soft. I think the fundamental problem uh, here, Sean, is that we had a response to an incredibly complex event that was governed by politicians and managed by health bureaucrats. And it's little surprise they got things wrong. I mean, for example, the lack of early contracting with Pfizer, the lack of the early rollout of the vaccine, the fact that they got the DHBs and the Ministry of Health to try and identify who should be vaccinated first. I think what the first thing we can learn from the last two years, Sean, is that when you have a complex event or a complex situation, you need competent governance. And that's the reason why ACC, the Reserve Bank and the Super Fund have professional boards of directors. And I think the other thing we've learned, Sean, is that when you want to manage something that's as complex as this, you need to be borrowing the best logisticians from Freightways and the best supply chain experts from Woolworths and Foodstuffs and put together a competent uh, management group rather than relying upon policy wonks in Wellington. And I think the third thing we've learnt from this pandemic, Sean, is how badly we behaved as a society. We tolerated a, an invasion of our privacy and we tolerated a surrender of our human rights in a way that I think is shameful. If you think about it, uh, because we were so frightened for our own well-being, we were, as I've said before, we rushed off, bought our body weight and toilet paper and headed home to our caves to wait out the flood. There's a lot of mixed metaphors there, I know. but um, They're all uh, but good in, ones, Des. They're all good ones. But in, in so doing, Sean, we abandoned people to die alone. Uh, we abandoned women to be alone after they gave birth. We developed a hostility to our neighbours. Uh, we crossed the street rather than even uh, pass within of them. Uh, supermarkets became one of the most hostile battlegrounds uh, this country's ever seen. I think we abandon our humanity in response to the existential risk of a respiratory virus. Sean, we, we reverted to Lord of the Flies behaviour. And, and I think uh, uh, one of the things we need to reflect upon is how quickly we as a society rolled over and played dead and, and allowed things to happen which should never have been allowed to happen. Mm. And if there is a residual effect of this, I think those issues you talked about and the questions they have raised and the fissures that they have exposed in our society are still very much with us. I, I want to quite concentrate in particular on the vaccination campaign. And there is a residual and very, very dedicated, and we call them anti-vaxxers, they hate it, people who are now convinced that the vaccine, the whole vaccine program was some sort of con, was Pfizer and the World Economic Forum, I don't know, trying to reduce the world's population and put something evil inside us. That is a very, very strong cult view in New Zealand and, my God, when I challenge it or take the mickey out of it, I know on social media that there's an incredibly vocal and organised minority of people who will climb in on it. I'd really yeah. like, because of your expertise and because I think of the unique perspective you bring to this, is the, was the vaccine a have? Were we lied to about the vaccine? What's no, I don't. No, I don't think so, Sean. I think the vaccine, uh, messenger RNA vaccines have been around a long time. There's nothing new about this particular technology. All that happened here was that there was an accelerated process of approval. And that's not surprising, Sean, when you look at the size of the prize. I mean, the, the prize being 
a safe uh, and reasonably accessible vaccine. The size of the prize was trillions of dollars. And so I think the fact that it was an accelerated uh, approval doesn't surprise me at all. I know there were some aspects of testing which uh, were not conducted, such as looking at uh, how much did it reduce transmission rate. I think, uh, again, but see, we haven't dealt with a vaccine before, Sean, that's job quickly evolved from preventing a disease to modifying a disease. I mean, historically, we took polio vaccine as kids in the 50s because we didn't want to get polio, so it was to prevent polio. Similarly with measles, mumps, rubella, these are vaccinations which essentially prevent the disease. Very quickly, this vaccination became justifiable on the basis of mitigating disease rather than preventing it. Really interesting you mention that because I have so many people sending me so many emails. We were told it would stop transmission. What's the latest thing amongst the idiots going around the internet? Oh, Pfizer admits it never tested for transmission. I was never under the impression that it was a cure-all, only that it would slow rates of transmission. It would reduce the chances of me going to hospital if I caught COVID. Um, I don't think the government miss, well, unless you were, I don't know, being willfully blind and had half a brain, there's no way you were told that was an absolute cure, that that was the silver bullet. Yeah, look, I think there's two issues you raise. Uh, The first is I think the only time the government misled us about the vaccine was that nonsense about us standing away from our place in the queue to allow more worthy countries to be vaccinated first. I just think that was an absolute myth invented to cover the fact that we had not done very well in terms of our purchasing and contracting. The idea that we would be global good citizens and and stand away from being vaccinated to allow more worthy countries to be vaccinated, uh, I think was an absolute myth. But the the anti-vax group, and I know they don't like that term, the reason why they behave the way they do, Sean, is it's faith-based. It's not, it's not fact-based, it's faith-based. And they've endowed their faith with special qualities and merit. And they now engage in confirmation bias. They, I promise you they're only hearing the bits that actually adhere to their point of view or their world view. The information that's contrary to it does go straight past them. Now, that's normal human behaviour. It's called confirmation bias. But when people have a faith-based position and they endow that position the way the anti-vaxxers have, then you should expect that their response will not be moderate. And I look at things, the latest brouhaha I was involved in is this um, uh, non-registered funeral home director who kind of vaguely said I saw blood clots in people and everyone I had or 80, 95% of my clients in the last two years died within two weeks of having the the vaccine. He provided no statistical analysis, no evidence as to how he gathered that data, but he became a national and then an international internet sensation amongst the anti-vax movement. And because he was a JP, he could do no wrong. Yeah, well, I think the cynical sort of undertones of which you described that are absolutely warranted. I mean, uh, it begs belief that people could have taken that Seriously, but that's the point I was making. Once you have a faith, anything which fits with that faith, you you will grab it, and that's called confirmation bias. Now, for a sceptical and critical thinker, which I think we both are, when you hear a story like that, it makes as much sense uh, as that guy Smith finding tablets somewhere in Western America. I mean, it it just is not credible. Yeah. Um, How, then, do we... And I guess cure the lingering symptoms that the whole COVID pandemic has left with us. And I think you have identified it. We abandoned our humanity. We compromised, uh, in some ways, our societal integrity. How do we cure that? Because you're not going to find the answer to that in a laboratory, are you, Des? No, that's right, Sean. I mean... uh One of the great myths of our management was the team of five million. When it suited us, we had the Prime Minister throw Vietnamese people under a bus. We had uh, Pacific Islanders in South Auckland marginalised. 
we had those three women who were given permission to go to Northland described as sex workers and gang and affiliated. And that was just complete touch, wasn't it? Yeah, completely. So what it was, though, is that uh, we managed uh, ourselves, we, man we were managed through fear and marginalising people. When it suited us, we threw people under a bus. And then eventually, of course, it became the vaccinated against the unvaccinated. Now, I always argued for vaccination, Sean, but I believed vaccination should bring some privilege. So it should have been an affirmative thing. If you're vaccinated, these are the privileges you will have. But what it turned into was a very negative campaign against the unvaccinated where they became very quickly marginalised and almost uh, um, regarded as satanic. We were being locked up because those buggers wouldn't go and get vaccinated. So I think the social rifts which occurred not just between families, but within families. I think there's a lot of healing to be done. I think this was mm. a very destructive pandemic. Uh, I think it's shown us a side of our society we didn't want to see. Um, we talk, you know, we've talked about this before, but one of the most interesting periods in history is Germany between the walls. And <laughs> the great question always is, how did such a civilised society descend into such barbaric behaviour, well, I think you've just seen a taste of it. Um, it yeah. didn't take us much to descend into what I regard as uh, inhuman barbaric yeah. behaviour. So well, they, I'll tell you what, the Germans did it all by the book. I've got a friend, um, a young friend who is currently writing an essay that looks at the system of law in Germany pre-World War II and how they codified the barbarity they did. You couldn't be a lawyer, be admitted to the bar unless you were a member of the Nazi party. You could be removed from a case if you too vigorously defended a, a Jewish person. But it was all codified. There were rules. There was a rule yep. of law. It was just a barbaric, intolerant yeah, no, and racist well, so the, rule of law. The, the, the same thing happened in medicine, uh, Sean. There's a very famous book called The Nazi doctors, which describes the corruption of the medical profession. And we need to remember that when those trains pulled up uh, at the sidings to decide who went to the farms or the factories and who got killed, those were doctors on the platforms making those decisions. So my profession corrupted almost completely. But the point we want to make here is that uh, the Germans weren't aliens. This is not the behaviour of a species we don't understand. We've seen the seeds of that sort of behaviour here in the last two and a half years, and shame on us. So I think when we have this inquiry, and I'd be surprised if this government actually runs a very thorough inquiry, I suspect we'll see, if they do anything, it'll be quite vanilla, uh, because that inquiry needs to look at just not how do we govern this sort of thing in the future and how do we get competent management in place, but also it needs to look at the very things we've been talking about, which is our behaviour, the, dis the dislocation of our uh, our humanity and our social behaviours, uh, and how do we make sure that doesn't happen again? Uh, because we are social beings, humans. Uh, we rely on social contact. As a species, we uh, rolled over the top of Neanderthal. They were smarter than us, probably. They were certainly stronger than us, but we were able to organise ourselves socially. And our social abilities is what uh, gave us the eventual triumph. But, Sean, you've had kids that didn't basically didn't go to school for two years. You've had kids that actually were isolated at home without any peer contact for several years. You've got people who've changed jobs, who've actually never been into the workplace that they are now working at. We, we had an uh, uh, extreme social experiment for two years in terms of isolation. And I think it will bear mental health consequence for a decade. Well, I, that, I don't that's think... such a good thing to say, Des. And I guess the thing is for the people who are making those decisions, in theory, in the laboratory, they may well have been completely justi justified. But I think you've hit on something this morning that is now resonating with me. In making those policy decisions which in a lab were exact, might have been exactly the right ones, we didn't factor in humanity. No. 
the uh, well, human condition. Well, the, 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 the planning and the rules and the codifying that you refer to were at the hands of politicians who were driven, and understandably so, by their own political risk and by public health doctors. Now, uh, no one ever went to medical school to fall in love with a spreadsheet and do epidemiology, Sean. Everyone goes to medical school because they want to prevent and treat disease and injury. So to some extent, public health is an unusual offshoot of medicine. And I think what you saw was two groups of people, the public health doctors who deal with populations rather than individuals, uh, behaving in a way which lacked that sense of uh, humanity and human touch and decency and the things that actually hold us together as a society. So I think the, the pandemic planning was at the hands of people who actually aren't in touch with individuals and individual disease and individual anxieties. When you think about populations, it's very easy to divorce yourself from the realities of day-to-day -day existence and what makes us as humans behave. Yeah, I would agree. Look, finally, Des, what a fascinating uh, conversation and my texts are going off. Largely, I'll admit, Des, from anti-vaxxers. So before you go, could you, for my own sanity, though I doubt it will have any effect, it will probably just enrage them more. In your, and it is an independent and informed and expert opinion, has, was the vaccine as it was promised or promoted, an effective counter to the pandemic? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, clearly this vaccine was developed for the Delta strain of the virus and its efficacy against Omicron was not as great in terms of preventing the disease. But I think the, the international evidence is overwhelming in that hit uh, the vaccine has reduced the likelihood that you and I will get very sick and need to go to hospital. And it's reduced the likelihood we'll die. And I think in that regard, the evidence is very clear. Are there a swathe of deaths and negative reactions to the vaccine that are somehow being suppressed by public health officials and Pfizer as part of a global conspiracy? Uh, well, look, I, I don't think we should uh, ever regard the pharmaceutical industry as being next to God. They certainly aren't. Uh, and there have been examples in the past where they have been less than forthright in reporting. But the idea that the entire medical system would be complicit in the hiding of deaths, because it wouldn't just be the public health people, that have to be the pathologists and the clinicians. There'd have to be a whole of health system conspiracy to conceal significant numbers of people dying from... Uh, vaccination effects. There certainly have been some, but I think you can count them on the fingers of one hand. And I know that the um, anti-vaccination group claim large numbers of people who have died and they say that's because of the vaccination. Well, I'd suggest there are a lot of other reasons why people died in the last two and a half years, of which vaccination is way down my list. Top of my list is the mental health distress, the anxiety, uh, the people that people didn't get treatment early, people avoided going to hospital. I think there are very good reasons why we've got excess mortality in the last few, few years. And so the point I'm going to raise here very quickly, Sean, because I know you're in a hurry, is... What <laughs> no, no, government... never in a hurry talking to you, Des. We can dump the news. We can keep talking as long as you want. Yeah. One of the things the government never did was develop a risk appetite. Uh, how much... How many jobs are you prepared to lose to prevent one COVID death? How many people dying of other diseases are you prepared to accept to prevent one COVID death? What is your risk appetite? Because, in fact, we had a policy based on zero tolerance of deaths. Now, in a zero-sum game in terms of health resources, that must mean you're going to accept higher mortality from other causes elsewhere. And so the one conversation we never had is what are we prepared to sacrifice in terms of economics and livelihood and our well-being to prevent one COVID death? And if you think about it, we don't have that conversation for influenza or anything else either. We, we don't have an explicit acceptance of risk. So along came 
this pandemic with a stated intent of zero COVID deaths, no tolerance for COVID deaths. And it didn't just warp the way we manage the pandemic, it actually warped the way we manage everything else as well. Yeah, I cannot disagree. Des, as always, just fascinating uh, talking to you. Oh, just very, very quickly, yes or no, are we in a post-pandemic, post-COVID world now, do you think? Uh, not entirely. I think <clears throat> there is still this time for this pandemic to run. I think there's the likelihood of future pandemics uh, is inevitable. So what we need right now, Sean, is a thorough assessment of what we've done and how to do it better because we will need to confront this series of challenges again. And quite frankly, we can't go about it the way we went about it this time. Thank you so much, Professor Des Gorman uh, there. And man, food for thought there. The texts are going crazy. Of course they would. Of course they would because we were suggesting that it's not all a vast conspiracy. But I love what Des said and uh, it sits with me. We didn't factor in humanity when it came to our COVID uh, response. And that has left a lot of people sore and hurt uh, in their souls. And you cannot discount the human experience when setting policy.